Welcome to the Exchange Art Artist Workshop Series. We are joined today by the one, the only, Lawrence Anthony. Super excited to chat with you, my friends. Thank you for joining us here. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm super excited to do this. I, I've seen a lot of the prior interviews, so uh, I'm yeah, really excited and uh, looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, it's been really cool to do these and uh, and just like a little reiteration of of kind of why. Uh, we feel like, you know, Twitter spaces are amazing, but you don't really get that in-depth view into the past, the present, and the future of what an artist is and what brought them to where they are. So we really feel like these more in-depth conversations can leave the viewers with some value to extract and, and really learn how maybe they can take a little bit of what you did and apply it to their own success going forward. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like this, this is one of the recurrent kind of uh, issues I've had with Twitter spaces is that they're kind of a group chat to a certain extent. So uh, it, it's not often, uh, you, you don't really get to learn too much about like what came before the, the whole NFT thing. It's, a, it's very act towards, uh, you know, what's going on right now in the space. What are you, you know, producing? And so, uh, yeah, I'm happy that that you uh, you came up with this uh, kind of formula for interviews because uh, I've learned a lot about uh, artists that I and friends that I've that I've known uh, for for quite a little little while now in the space, but I didn't know a lot about their lives. So, yeah, really excited about this. Well, it's really good to hear that from you because I mean that's you're directly who we're trying to make these videos appeal to, like you, the artist. Uh, you touched on right where I want to kick things off, and that's. You know, how did you start as an artist? I see this amazing painting behind you. You were just speaking about uh, being in your stu home studio. Um, like, how did this journey artistically begin for you? And, and how did it lead to, to now being in Solana? Oh, man. Uh, the journey as an artist really began uh, very, very early on. Um, as far as I remember, I mean, like, I, I, I've been drawing... I can't even remember when I first started drawing uh, and and it was kind of a mean for me to uh, evacuate uh, some of the, the artistic kind of interests that I had. I watched a lot of uh, cartoons when I was a kid. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uh, was one of my favorite ones. Uh, Dragon Ball Z, of course. Um, and I, I recall uh, being four years old and meeting my my very first friends at the uh, the kindergarten, drawing these characters, and they would like gravitate around me and be like, "Whoa, these are these are really good, you know? Like, uh, you like this kind of stuff." And then we just kind of bond on 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 that basis. So, you know, uh, I started very young. Uh, I think uh, also I was I was lucky enough to have parents that exposed me to all sorts of. Uh, of artistic kind of mediums and uh, kind of, uh, you know, we would go to the museum with my mother uh, when I was very young. I remember seeing a, an Andy Warhol uh, exhibit when I was about six years old or something like that. So there was that interest from the get-go. Uh, my father, um, the documentary film director, and uh, oh, wow. he also produced, uh, he, he produced a children's show. And, uh, so one thing you, you need to know about me, though, is that my, my father passed away when I was very, very young. I was five years old. And I think that uh, it, was, it was sort of the catalyst to uh, my artistic development, to a certain extent. It was a way to channel uh, emotions that I, I don't think I knew how to channel as a kid. And so uh, I was a very kind of shy kid uh, and very kind of introverted spend a lot of time alone and just you know draw a shit ton and uh but i think that also uh knowing how to channel those emotions uh not maybe not like verbally but at least uh artistically uh kind of helped me uh, you know uh, become a bit more social i think uh, i was i was very shy early on but then after that i kind of grew out of that and also you know like it's it's probably I'm not, I'm not a, a therapist, although I've, I have been a therapy uh, later on in life, but uh, I think that there was a moment where I needed to kind of uh, 
to, to, to be that introverted kid and to kind of develop artistically to, um, to process those emotions in, in a certain way. So I kept drawing throughout my, my teens and then uh, kind of went in and out of it because uh, I wasn't really encouraged at school specifically to pursue an artistic career. Um, I went to a school that had like a, a good science program and I, I was good enough to, you know, ha have the grades needed to kind of pursue more of a, uh, more of a, a science and, and kind of a, I don't know. It was like a gen general science kind of background. So um, in Quebec, uh, we, we, we have a, an education system that basically we don't have like a junior high school and senior high school. We, we only have five years of high school and then we go to this kind of uh, pre-university. Uh, yeah, it's like kind of pre-university school called CJEP. It's two years basically to kind of uh, allow students to kind of figure out what they want to do in life, right? before they actually go into, uh, or if they want to go into you know, higher learning, um, it helps them figure it out. It also like for, for people who want to do something that's a bit more technical as a job, you know, there's three years programs and four years programs to just kind of like finish their studies and then, you know, go directly into the job market. And uh, I didn't really know what to do when I kind of started CJEP. I, I just went into science to have the grades for it. Uh, but, but then like, I remember, I recall this very specific moment where I was in, in, my, math, in my math class and like my, my teacher was explaining something that I was, you know, I was kind of already understanding and I wasn't really listening and I was looking around, drawing people. And then I looked at my, I looked at my, I said sketchbook, but like I, it was a notebook, but it was really more of a sketchbook because I looked at it and it was just full of drawings and I was like... <laughs> what am I doing here? Like, what is it? What? I don't enjoy this. Like, why am I, why am I here? And, and then I had, I had that talk with my, my mother and uh, she was like, you know, this, like I felt this might happen, but you're, you're pretty much just like your father. So if you want to pursue an artistic career, I'll support you in that, uh, which is amazing. You know, like, uh, no, you know, you, you hear stories of like families not being supportive towards their, their children or their, you know, like uh, some, some of their family members, uh, artistic careers. And to me, it was the complete opposite. Like uh, I had a, a mom that was pretty stern and, and really kind of strict, but she was very supportive. Uh, so yeah, after that, uh, it was more figuring out exactly what I wanted to do artistically because I was, it was a bit all over the place. I went into film because I, you know, like that's what my dad did. And I think that like subconsciously, I was like, yeah, I'm going to try to be like, my dad and yeah. like finish off what he couldn't finish. Um, so I went into film and learned uh, about, you know, editing, about storytelling through, you know, visual narrative. Um, I learned about photography um, and, uh, and I applied to film school afterwards. Uh, I applied to both film production and film animation because, you know, I was good at drawing and, uh, I felt like I could probably do both and I had an interest for both. And um, I got accepted in both, but I chose to go into film animation. And that was, that was a very interesting kind of uh, decision because like, it, it's kind of like I had shifted from like having a purely film interest to like being like, yeah, maybe like I want to draw in, 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 in filmmaking. And I, I, I I didn't really know what I was getting into at the time, you know, like I didn't really know how hard animation the field is. So, you know, I, I went into it and uh, did a year and just really didn't like it. Uh, but also just because the program was, uh, it wasn't up to date with the, the animation standards. Uh, so at the time, you know, like we're well into the 3D animation kind of, uh, the beginning of 3D animation's popularity. And my school was still teaching me how to use like these old, like old film cameras and these massive like animation tables where you have these like cogs where you have to like, <laughs> and to, like move your drawing to a certain place to make these like pan movements. Uh, and just like, and then you like have to edit your film with like uh, this thing called a steam bag, which like cut your film and glued it. And they, their rationale behind that was like, you have to learn basically filmmaking before you can even 
know how to like do the rest. And so the first year was supposed to be that, but it broke me. Like I just kind of like I was like, I don't want to do this in life. Like I like animation, but that's it. like the art of movement is probably not the the thing that I want to do. So I shifted. I applied to painting school. It was like a, a pretty uh, um, I don't know the word in English contingency. Uh, like a like a program that's like a bit difficult to get into. Mm. Um, they, they accepted like 30 people, I think, per year. Um, and like a prestigious. I got it, you know, yeah, like prestigious or, yeah, like, uh, I don't remember exactly. There's another word. But anyway, like, uh, I, I got into that program and, and that's where I started. Uh, I wasn't even painting. I was doing mostly large scale drawing at the time. Um, and uh, yeah, like, I think I, I, at that point, I just continued on. <clears throat> but I finished my studies and I didn't go directly into an art career because I, I didn't really know what to do. It's very confusing when you finish university yeah. uh, art school because they don't really guide you in the right direction. They kind of expect you to figure it out on your own um, or to just go straight to a master's degree or something like that. Right. Um, so, yeah, like I, I, I don't know if you studied art as well, uh, but like because uh, you, you – I feel like you approve in the way that you like understand understand exactly what I mean. I have a lot of friends who did art school, so I uh, I, I feel like I saw them go through the same path of like now what, and I think yeah. I think about three fourths of them went the route of uh, let's get a master's, and then they graduated with the master's, and they went now what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's 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 kind of crazy that they don't really tell you like, this is what you'll need to be doing step by step. And also like use this time right now to make the right connections and to, uh, you know, create yourself a network and to really bond with like some of your fellow students, because uh, those are the people that you'll be seeing out there, you know, like, and uh, <laughs> they don't really emphasize that at all. They just kind of tell you, you know, you need to know how to, conceptualize you know projects you need to know how to um you know like more the the, the like uh, process of creation right as, at least when it comes to the, the bachelor's degree uh in fine arts that's pretty much what they teach you they don't really teach you about uh pr you know promoting or or marketing yourself uh or even you know applying for grants applying for call for submissions you know uh you know they, they teach you the lingo but they don't teach you how to use it uh so right coming out of that i i kind of worked in galleries and museums for, for a little bit and i even had design jobs and i kind of like went in and out of like all these different jobs and uh at some point i was uh you know i was at a place where i was just kind of like uh, a bit of at a loss and i decided to go live in japan with my ex-girlfriend and uh, we we moved there, kind of like st had a bit of money in our bank account, and just like yeah, let's go let's go live in Japan and see what uh, see what happens. And there was a there was a specific moment. Uh, it was seeing the Takashi Murakami exhibit at the Mori Art Museum, where I was like, this is like pretty much what I want to do, you know, like. <laughs> I want to make these like <laughs> gigantic like paintings um not like murakami and it's not even because i like murakami's work per se um i, I do like his work but like i i think i just valued his like the the, the work ethic you know like in the just like the yep. just the the, the the body of work right like what like what the the message I, I felt like I had some something to say as well, and uh, I didn't quite know yet how to say it. Uh, so at that point, I, I think I applied for, for for this like art contest that was taking place in London, and uh, I got shortlisted for the finalist exhibit, and pretty much knew right then and there that I was like, yeah, I should probably be doing this as a as a career because. Uh, you know, this is this is what I'm good at, essentially. So coming back from Japan, I I, I went 
really deep into it and uh, started applying for call for submissions and for, you know, gallery shows and talked to a few galleries for representation, even though they, <laughs> they had these ridiculous contracts with like 60% of your earnings going to them. So I was just like, wow, okay. Uh, so I didn't accept any of those, uh, luckily. <clears throat> But uh, yeah, like uh, like uh, I think the the true kind of like artistic career really started maybe like eight years ago, the, despite the fact that like I had done so much before that. I think that like if like you really you really understand what it is to be a, a professional artist, or to to at least try to be a professional artist when you you have to do all the things that don't revolve around creation, but that revolve around like getting your work out yep. there. Yep. Oh, that's super interesting, man. It's, it's really amazing to hear like what has led <laughs> people up to where they are. Like when you just look at your art on an exchange or just the artwork that you've minted, you don't get this really like deep catalog of like, like this is the trenches that, that you had to go through to get to where you're even able to convey the message that you want to convey. Right. And I think you said something really special, which is like, that combination of passion versus like, I'm good at this versus I'm really committed to like making myself better at this, you know, like th those three things add up and then they kind of start to propel you along, along the way. Um, when was it that you found NFTs? So NFTs was, uh, uh, basically I was, I was preparing for a show, um, right before COVID. Uh, so I had done this uh, body of work, which is essentially uh, 99 portraits of people. Uh, people would come to the studio and I would uh, basically paint them in the span of two hours. A very interesting project, but it, like it took me like a really long time. I would do, you know, two, three a weeks. Um, yeah, like, a, and, and I had a gallery that was very interested in having the, the project uh exhibited and it was going well and then this whole COVID thing happened and uh we had to postpone the show and and then the gallery was like yo we're like gonna have to close because like our financing is like out the window um it's a really tough time you know like it was and all while this was happening uh there was like this huge news of like nft like people like hitting hitting like the jackpot like uh, people like and stuff like that and these nft selling for like millions i was like what the hell is this like and <laughs> specifically i remember seeing the board yacht uh the board ape uh, yacht club uh and just being like i don't even understand what is going on you know <laughs> like this is crazy and uh but but that was my first exposure to, to nft was like uh when it got into the news really uh i didn't really know much about it before then i think i had kind of like heard whispers in, in the wind but didn't really mind them much um and i was someone who's already doing a lot of digital art at that point but i didn't really use it in any way uh i think i, I would sell like prints here and there but like not really like not anything that was like sustainable so um one of my friends though got really really into it and he's an artist on tezos and he was like oh man you should like you shouldn't you shouldn't you shouldn't go on ethereum because like it's all you know pfp generative pfp projects i didn't even know what that was at that point i was like yeah sure whatever <laughs> and uh and then he was like uh yeah you should try tezos like it's a lot more experimental it's a lot more like uh kind of people are having a lot more fun and it's not really like, uh, like you can make money, but also just like, it's, it's, it's a great place to kind of exchange. And, and I didn't really know what he meant. I, I had never used Twitter at that point. Like I think, right. I, I think I had a Twitter account that was active for like last five years. And the people I was following was like Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> Oh, I love that. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Uh, you're a little frozen. Okay. Oh, wait, you're back. Good? All right, yeah, you're back. Yeah, you're back. All yep. Right, cool. Sorry, the, the internet in Canada is like probably the worst 
uh, <laughs> no like, worries. It's, no worries at all. And we don't we don't get a good service. Uh, but yeah, uh, so yeah, like he he kind of uh, showed me Hick and Nunk, and uh, I hated it. It, it, was, <laughs> it was so bad. Like this was like I think in the early early days of Hick and Nunk. Yep, and it was just terrible. Like I tried to. I tried to mint something and it would just like it was minted but like it wouldn't show up like the preview wouldn't show it <clears throat> so I just remember being like this this is the worst and then he's like well you know you can, you can always try to apply for like Ethereum stuff like super rare and foundation and um, I did but never heard from them and learned soon after that it was, it was a lot like it was pretty much just like through connections that you can get into those platforms, especially at that time. I think it was like, it was just starting off. So like it was word of mouth, you know, like, I don't know, like it was, it wasn't anything uh, that some random person with like five followers on Twitter uh, could, <laughs> could get right. into, I think. Um, so yeah, like uh, I didn't hear from them. So I was kind of like, just kind of like gave up on NFTs for like about a year, a year and a half, um, and uh, did some a lot of TikTok. <laughs> My TikTok career was like bumping at the time because we were stuck at like the, the restrictions in Quebec were like crazy. Like we were stuck yeah. at home. Uh, they would not let you know, like we we had a curfew that was like eight o'clock at that point, and so and I was working from home, so I was just like basically couldn't single so like it, like i would see many people a lot of my friends were like kind of scared to like see each other unless it was like just like walking outside in the middle of the day uh so it was, it was a strange time so i just i don't know i kind of naturally got into tiktok and uh it, it kind of revived my my uh my love for like video editing and just kind of uh and, building kind of promotional video and it also taught me yeah. how to promote myself as an artist uh in, in the uh for uh, when it comes to video and yeah um I, although i don't really touch tiktok much anymore um i've learned a lot from it and i think it was uh kind of pivotal to like how i first started in solana actually because so Solana, like uh, I had a friend who was just starting off on Solana, and uh, he was the one that in charge of the the weird toys project. It was like a bunch of kind of animals, uh, some of them animated, some of them not. And uh, he was doing really well, and he was like, "Yo, like I'm selling these weird toys for like something around like eight hundred dollars," and I was like, "What? Like this is crazy." And he was, he was like, yeah, you should, like, you, you would probably kill on, on, uh, on Solana. Like, I didn't, I'd never heard of Solana before, but he was like, yeah, you show your work on Solana. Like, you, you probably do pretty well. And I, I was like, I don't, I don't honestly know how to do any of this. I forgot about, like, how to mint and NFT and all that stuff. And he was like, okay, like, he showed me through the process. He basically, like, took my hand and showed me how to, like, make a wallet he put two soul in my wallet. And this is a, and, and this is crazy because this is a, at a point where, so I came into the bear market, like it was in February. Uh, it yep. was the start of the bear market, but like soul was still at like, I think 140 back then or something like that. And so he gave me two soul, which was like $280. I was like, yo, like, are you sure? Like, I was, like, <laughs> I was feeling kind of uncomfortable that he would give me so much money, but I didn't understand that like, you know, as you get into NFTs and crypto, like if like sometimes feels like this ma this this money is like magic money, right? Like it, <laughs> yes, it, it's not real money. So like I now understand that like him giving me two soul was like just him being like yeah, like whatever, like you'll <laughs> you'll do fine with it. So um, gave me two soul, and then he was like, uh, think of like a series. Uh, which is not too different from like how I would operate in real life. You know, you, you think of a body of work and the number of pieces that you want in that body of work and then um, how to, sh how to present it, how to showcase it. Right. So uh, that's when my first uh, collection on Holtex was launched and the promotion I had for it was like, I had made these like video, the first, first I like, I made like kind of like a, 
and this was like coming out of TikTok, sort of. So like, like I had made this video, which was like all the layers of my my piece, kind of like panning very slowly. And you had the it's uh, Piaf's um, "Je ne regrette rien," which is like a really epic kind of French classic French song um, that you hear in like a Inception or whatever. Like it's like an epic yep. song, right? Like with like lots of chords. And I remember making this like this video to promote it and then to be like, yeah, this is the date that it's going to be released. And I think I got a lot of people hyped up about it because you had like Nightman and like oh, and all those people, like uh, Erhan, like uh, bidding on it. And um, I think the first few sold for like four or five and six sold or something like that. I was like, holy shit. Like, this is like for me, this is like mind blowing at the time. I was like, this yeah. is incredible, you know, like a huge revelation and very addictive as well. You know, like that's that's the thing that they don't tell you is when you have like a, just like, even if it's not huge success, like just a minimal success, like uh, in uh, like starting off in crypto can be very addicting. Uh, so, yeah, like uh, I, I just kind of continued on in that vein. A certain extent and here we are <laughs> oh that's really cool like i feel like it's like a series of happy accidents that lead most of us to nfts but it's uh <laughs> it's really amazing how you were able to like take all of the things that you've learned like little bits and pieces of it and then apply it to this new world you were like oh wait like there's a lot of stuff that parallels exactly the other worlds that i come from and you were able yeah. to kind of quickly quickly act on that which i think is it's pretty a powerful thing. Yeah, and it's it's um, it's maybe not a, a popular kind of uh, opinion, but I would say that there are so many parallels between the NFT and crypto, and uh, there's just the art market. You know, like uh, yeah, all the controversies that we see in in crypto and in uh, NFT, we see in you know the stock market and the art market as well. Uh, it's just that it happens much less quicker, so it feels yeah. it feels more important when it happens in crypto, just because it happens in like one shot. But that kind of stuff happens all the time, and like like just just the FTX controversy, like that kind of stuff has happened in the past, like outside of crypto, like people yep. ripping other people off for like millions. Come on, like so, um, yeah, like just. Uh, when it comes to you know the, like collector relationship and all that stuff, you know it it, it it's not something that I was too. It, it wasn't a huge revelation for me, or I didn't have to learn, or I didn't need a crash course uh, when it comes to that uh, coming into like a, the NFT uh, space. So when you when you came in the the second time, obviously. Did you see the need to like galvanize community around your art? No, and that's the, that's the thing. That's probably the thing. I mean, I'm sociable, so like uh, by default, I think I just kind of like started following people that I really valued and people I had heard. And oh, I also didn't really do spaces at first. Like uh, I think that yeah. like my friend was like, "Oh yeah, you should, you should try doing spaces," and at first I was like, "I don't know," and like kind of intimidating. <laughs> So um, there's a few things that I would have done different coming into this space, but uh, the first thing would would have been to not release work right away, to just kind of just go into like spaces, listen to people, and then uh, maybe go up, talk about your art, and kind of uh, uh, tease people about like your incoming kind of genesis. You know, like that's, that's something that always helps, but. I just kind of went into it uh, as though it was like the direct continuation of you know my real life art career, and I didn't really right. think I, I should get to know my community first, right? Like, uh, so there's definitely that I, I would have done differently. Um, uh, but but like I think that just intuitively I, I became friends with uh, with a bunch of people who I'm still friends with, and. Uh, that became also just kind of like uh that I feel like that that like uh that those friendships uh made us want to kind of form communities of our own because we would see communities around us that wouldn't really interact with us like uh you know like the URS and 
and uh, I mean, um, in Mon- Monkey Dow, you know, like uh, all those communities, we, like we didn't really know what they were because we're all kind of new to the space. And by we, I'm right. talking about like uh, people like uh, like Duke and and Joyce. We like uh, we're all we all came into the space kind of like more or less at the same time, and. Yeah, like uh, we didn't really know how to interact with these communities, so we just kind of figured we'd make our own community, or like we'd just make our own little kind of nook, and um, that's that's when the kitchen, uh, which is a community uh, Discord, uh, was birthed to a certain extent uh, through us three and uh, Eric, uh, Ghost Rider, who was like kind of like the really the the glue to bind it all because we had a bunch of ideas creative ideas but we didn't really have any organization and we also decided to make that because we just didn't like discord and we didn't want to manage our own discord and we wanted like a discord to just kind of you know like have fun and and discuss art and just like uh, promote our work and have it also promoted to other people's kind of collector base you know like uh, so it was a good choice, and uh, I think that was the first kind of experience of building community. But it it really started off as like like anything. It started off as like just like wanting to to have fun, you know. Like, and I think that's yeah. very important when it comes to community building. Is like, do not go into community building uh, for money. <laughs> yes like that's not a that's not a thing and it you know same with like uh and we'll get to it but like same with mass warriors it, like i didn't expect to make money off mass warriors you know it was mostly just for for fun at first i think people forget about that element right they they see like the business side of what this is and then they start to focus so much on that that they miss this really important part which is just connecting with other human beings and like, no one wants to be miserable on the internet. Like we, so many people already do that in, in their average daily life. And like the internet is meant to be an escape, you know, a place where you go to have fun. So I, mm. I really agree with that. And I, I, I try to tell people that all the time. Cause like, especially hearing new artists come into the space, you hear so much stress. Everything is like, how do I do this? How do I do that? Like I'm lost. And then it's like, stop for one second, like be yourself have some fun and like do yeah. it nice and slow, you know, like yeah. see what everyone else is doing and like figure out what you can make work for yourself. Yeah. And try things and don't put pressure on yourself. You know, like I think that, uh, I mean, like I, I think that I've always been kind of a competitive person. And so I think that's part of the fun for me is like the, that competitive aspect. But, um, but also, I wouldn't do it if I wasn't uh, if I wasn't having any fun, you know. Like, uh, and I, I, I there were a few moments where I was like, I'm not having fun anymore, you know. Like, and should I stop? Yeah. And those are the moments where you 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 don't need to stop. You just need to take a break, you know, and to like kind of see where you can find the fun again. And um, I think that links also to marketing to a certain extent, you know, and. Uh, I was talking, I think it was uh, to Dark Art of Miller. Uh, and he was asking me, you know, like, uh, or not asking me, he wasn't asking me. He was telling me that he had, he was, like, coming up with a plan for better marketing, that we would be, like, more organized. And I was like, yeah, sure. Like, this, it's, it's good to have a plan, but, but also, like, it's super, and this is my personal opinion on this, like, it's super important to have fun also in marketing. And it sounds like the stupidest advice, like, oh, yeah, we have fun, you know, but, but, <laughs> but it is very important because if, if, if you have a playful marketing and if it seems like it's like, it, it, it's fresh and, and fun and just kind of like not really striving for like a serious and a, a kind of pretentious kind of uh, frame of work, you know, uh, I think that people relate to that a lot more and, that's you see it in like uh, new collections like uh, Nippies uh, or or uh, stuff like uh, Bear Marketer, you know, like those are fun fun collections and people relate to them because of that. I think um, there are also PFP collections, but like there are other stuff that's not PFP collections. That's just like yeah, like, kind of like Trev. 
Like yeah, Trev's, yeah, yeah, yeah. his marketing material is like better than like three fourths of the people's artwork sometimes. I'm just like, how did you make such fun and like creative marketing? Like what? Yeah, Trev is a beast. And we actually were talking about that with uh, Dark Art and Miller. Like I was like, Trev is like, Trev touches on like some some really nostalgic elements. Uh, I think a lot of like us, specifically I would say millennials, but like definitely yeah. just like, it even taps into you know newer stuff and just how it's presented is so uh you know so it's so like enticing right like it, it feels like uh you're watching a movie or like uh previews of a series or something like that so it makes you want to to kind of like engage with the work and yeah like uh it's as, as far as marketing it's like one of the the, the most fun stuff i, I remember also Wetico, uh doing like a, a, a knife fight auction at some point, <laughs> whatever that <laughs> meant. I think it was like Mills that like, like had like uh, just commented on one of his things. And then like what had just come up with this knife fight auction uh, format, which I, I don't even <laughs> remember what it was. I think it was something along the lines of like an incremental uh, kind of like it, it like, it like increased the, amount you needed to bid every time you bid so like it was oh, like, wow. like yeah like some some crazy thing like that where i don't really quite remember but like, <laughs> but but also he you know he's, he's he's that type of guy where you'll just kind of like on a on a whim like start an auction and it'll be like a special type of auction and so keeps it fun for himself keeps it fun for others and i think that's uh you know that's that's the the whole point of it right like we're, we're and especially in a bear market what else do you have to do you're not you're you you're, are you gonna wait for the, the bull to come in like a year or two you know like uh, just just have fun and try things you know like this is the yeah. point of and this is the this is also where you get to kind of analyze what works and what doesn't i always like to say too that like this and and we we overthink all of this so much but like one of the beautiful things about the blockchain is like it's like your art history is now glued to a permanent portfolio so like someone in the future can can look back on a certain era of your experimentation and and who knows they might fall in love with that specific age like you know it's like oh wow the 2022 era of of Lawrence Anthony, you know, it's so hot right now. We don't know, right? Like that that could be the reality. And I think it's one of the beautiful things of having it. Like art history is now like living somewhere, which is a really interesting kind of new realm to step into. Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, it's also uh, terrifying for artists to <laughs> yes. just kind of like to to know that like their work is like registered and like documented. And uh, that they could look back at it at any point and be like, "Wow, I did that." <laughs> it's good. It's crazy bad. too. You could always also just be like, "You know what? I'm done with this persona. I'm gonna go be like this anonymous figure making this artwork." And like yeah, that exists yeah. a little bit in in like traditional art world. There's a couple figures, as we all know, that like play upon that thing. But it's been something in Web three that I've enjoyed so much, uh, which kind of naturally leads me to the mass warriors, you know, it's like, put your mask on and, and let's go be anonymous together. But like, how did it go from paint to pixels? And, and how was this extremely fun and successful collection born? So, um, so mass warriors kind of was um, a sister collection originally of another collection I was doing on form function. It was just called um, Rose. It means a uh, pink man in French. And uh, it was essentially this like a uh, cyberpunk kind of uh, story, like kind of like epic story uh, taking taking place in like 18 pieces. So the story we told through 18 uh, digital paintings. And I had done this crazy marketing. Like this is what I, I'm talking about when I'm, I'm saying have fun with your marketing. Like I had done this, this crazy marketing where I would basically every day for two weeks would change my PFP these like hand-drawn balaclava masks um and every day would like kind of like zoom in closer and flesh a bit more the uh the face that was behind the mask and with each kind of change of pfp you know you can write a message right when you change your pfp on twitter 
Yeah. Uh, so I would I would write like a a, a, a snippet of like the the a pre the, the kind of prelude to the actual story. So you get like a kind of like a just like a a, a bit of story that uh, preceded the actual narrative. Uh, every time I change my PFP every morning. And so I did that for like two weeks and then my like, boom, like big announcement, like this huge announcement video and people were like super hyped about it. And uh, uh, which was really cool. And then I was like, you know what, to, to take it further, uh, I have this piece, like bunch of masks uh, that I made. And so like, and they were all like, kind of these like, they're kind of similar to the mass warriors, but they were hand drawn and painted, you know, like uh, digital yeah. painted and hand, digital hand drawn. But like, you know, they look like more like, like, like what I'd, I'd be making uh, in in real life. And yeah, like I don't know, I had all these masks. I was like, oh, to like pop it off, like every every person who will. This was really popular at the time. PNFTs, you know, like participation in NFTs. Mm -hmm. um, everyone who's going to bid on the piece will get uh, one of these men. And, and so you'll be part of this like gang of like ruffians that were <laughs> have these mat. And so um, I remember I had like, uh, I think uh, I had like made 11 masks or something like that. Cause the last two were not really quite masks. They were just kind of like, these like whatever. So I made a couple more and one of them was a, a pixel mask. And I was already kind of experimenting with, pixel art at that point because uh so it, like for most of you who don't know i i'm actually a, a digital arts teacher like uh, like i i do that and i do my art career i i work like 60 65 hours a week total i'm kind of a wow nutcase when it comes to that but uh, <laughs> through the pandemic i had experimented with this uh, website called pixel art uh, if i remember mm -hmm. correctly and i was giving these like online workshops to kids uh, about how to like make pixel art on on this website, and so I, I, I was that was kind of like uh, um, more or less uh, like in parallel to like the beginning of uh, of Mass Warriors, where I was like, well, I have like this knowledge about pixel art, and also just I'm, I'm a you know I I'm a gamer. Uh, I've been playing video games my whole life, so I have like this vast knowledge of like you know uh, video game history. Um, and just like I had references, right? Like I knew yeah. where I was going with like pixel art just because I remembered looking at pixel art throughout my life, you know, playing uh, games like Final Fantasy III on Super Nintendo or something, you know, stuff like that, like uh, Pokemon on Game Boy. So it felt like a natural transition and the, and the narrative of Amhose was like kind of like a, it dealt a bit with like kind of like video games and like, it was like a cyberpunk virtual world, right? Like it's like a character trying to escape this virtual reality uh, to yep. break into, you know, the actual world or what he thinks is the actual world. So um, the narrative was that he removes the mask and the mask is kind of like the shackles that kept him into the, the actual kind of weird virtual reality. So the mask that was a very important symbol and so that was naturally like what I would give as a PNFT would be like the mask. Here's your, you, you have your shackles uh, and you, you are free from this virtual reality. Just like that. 13 people bid on that auction. Uh, so I gave those 13 masks, one of them being the, one of the, the original mask warrior. Um, and I remember gathering up these, these people and, and like, th these were like, uh, people were like uh, Duke, you know, Joyce, obviously I think there was Magellan in there. Um, Nightman. Um, I think I'm not 100 percent sure, but like there were like also just like people I didn't know. So mm -hmm. I gathered them up in like a, a group chat, and I was like, "Here, like show show your mask." And uh, when uh, Carolina, which is the person who got the mask, like the original mask warrior, uh, present like like showed her mask, everyone was like what the hell i want that pixel mask like <laughs> <laughs> and like everyone forgot about their own mask and just was like they were like obsessed with the pixel mask and i kind of knew at that point i had something and i was like well should i make more of these and then they were like yeah, absolutely like we'll buy them for sure and uh so i, I made like the first 13 masks because i thought that all of them would buy one mask each so i made 13 masks and i, I put them up for sale and then i, I 
and like I would contact them and be like, oh, like uh, they're like zero point five sold, you know, like whatever. So if you want to buy one, like they're they're not too too expensive. Little did we know that was a lot of money, <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, I don't even remember how much sold was that at that point. I think it was like fifty or something, something like that. But uh, not all of them bought them, so I had some left, and I was like. But like just like sending DMs to people being like, you want to buy a pixel mask? And um, I remember like uh, just being like, ah, fuck it. I'll just like list them. So I listed them and then they like went like right away. And I was like, yeah, that's weird. And then I was like, maybe I should do this every week. And the next week I'm going to like try to raise the price by like 0.25. So just see what happens. Um, and I'm going to like do this every Friday morning. And uh, I gathered up the people that bought the original mask, the first 13, and I was like, into a group chat. And mm-hmm. at that point, it wasn't even like, yeah, we're going to like start a, a, a gang and like, uh, it was just like, I need help. Like, I don't know what, what I'm doing with this. And uh, <laughs> like, what, what should I do? And then they were just like, uh, I think I remember like, uh, it was Luke, Luke X Dodd. You know, he does the uh, Esther uh, collection. He was like, yeah, like, uh, look, it would be funny if we all put on these, like, PFPs and just, like, went into, like, Twitter spaces. So we went into, like, Toshi's forum and just kind of, like, like stood there and did nothing. And they would be like, what the fuck, what the fuck is up with these ninjas, you know? Like, <laughs> and that was our fun for, like, for, like, a good, like, two, three weeks. We would just do that and have fun, like, doing so. And then, like, in the group chat, be like, yo, that was a funny reaction. Or we'd show up in these like jet because it was really early in the morning. So we'd show up in these like Japanese Twitter spaces sometimes, <laughs> and they would just be like, like uh, you know, I understood a bit what they were saying, and they were just kind of like, "What the fuck is up with these like Naruto ninja?" <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I don't know. Like looking back at it, it, it felt not serious. It wasn't serious. It was just like for fun. But uh, but then at some point, it was definitely like, well. They're going in like the span of five minutes, 13 masks in five minutes every Friday. Like, I feel like this is something and we should probably like escalate it to something more serious. Uh, I think it was around maybe like the third or fourth wave at that point that was like, people were starting to notice, you know, and, and uh, yeah, it became like much more of a solid community and, uh, all just like lovely people and, and talented artists as well, which was, uh, I mean, it wasn't too surprising considering that we had already kind of formed that kind of community through the kitchen. So like, like I think that mass words is essentially just an extension of the kitchen to a certain extent, right? right. Like people in the kitchen gained interest to mass words. Uh, but I think that like, yeah, it it was an extension, kind of like what you know, like how pop heads is is an extension of the kitchen as well, or you know, uh, Joyce's critters, little like, dudes, you know. Uh, so yeah, that's really cool, man. It's uh, it's so interesting to hear like how how like all of a sudden you realize like oh, it's like oh man, I'm on to something here. It's like maybe I should put like a little bit more into this and like watch what it becomes then. So it's really cool to hear, hear how that, like, you didn't try to force that, right? You didn't come into this with the idea of, like, let me make the coolest community in the world. You know, it's like, no, you 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 organically created something. And then, like, that momentum started to pick up, which I think is uh, something that, like, you know, you can't force, what do I say? You can't force a square into a circle or whatever. It's like, it's the same kind of concept, right? It's like, if the community yeah. likes something, they like it. And then, you know, from there, you get to control how, you portray the rest of it, which is, is something that I think you've done really well. Uh, I appreciate that. And and I, I sometimes am not too sure. Yeah. There, there are moments where I question myself. Definitely. Like I, th- I feel, I think that people, I think that people really think that I have a lot more of a plan. I do now for when it comes to mass words, but I think that like back then they really thought I was like, master like a mastermind at like engineering uh engagement or something like that and i was like it really wasn't <laughs> that it was like it was mostly just the help of my community like the people that were that were part of mass warriors 
really love to play the game and to like go into Twitter spaces every Friday to raid Twitter spaces. And it's just, uh, you know, and I think that back then the market, the market sentiment was like, you know, kind of like ongoing bear market. So like a lot of people were like starting to disappear from the space and the people that were still there were like really in it for just community and for the fun and just, uh, and, and not, not really caring too much about sales. I mean, we, we do care about sales. We're all there to make a living uh, as artists. But but we, we, like, I think that aspect of it, because I was still kind of releasing my, my, my other work simultaneously, the mass warriors aspect of it was really more for fun at that point. And it, it, it also kind of made me realize that, uh, you know, marketing can be fun. Right, like, and and this is, goes back to what I was saying earlier. It, it's really important to to kind of to capitalize on that whenever you're trying to promote your work. Is how can I make this fun for myself? Because it's not fun to promote your work. No, I don't. I don't know any artist that really is like, yeah, man, like marketing is my thing. You know, <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, it can be, but like, I think pretty much every artist just wants to create. You know, like that's the real fun of it. And, uh, yeah, I, I've always kind of been, I, I've always kind of like really despised marketing my, my work. Uh, if you look at my Insta, there's not that many pictures of me. I really didn't, don't like to, kind of like putting me or my face out there, uh, when it comes to my art, but the more you, you know, the more kind of like, the more you, you just grow up as an artist, you evolve as an artist, the more you realize, I think, uh, that it is an integral part of your success and not, not your face. I just mean like promoting yourself, right. And like uh, marketing yourself. Uh, it, it's really important. And, you know, if, if you don't know how to do that, or if you don't want to learn how to do that, then you, know, you, you don't have to, but <laughs> it's going to be a bit more difficult. It's going to take a lot more time. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, there are those like few, like very specific kind of success stories that happen. Like, oh yeah, we picked him up in the street, and like he was, you know. But like that happens. It's like one in a million, you know. Like Basquiat, you know, like uh, even yeah, but even Basquiat like was like part of a community. People knew him, you know, like in the streets for being that guy who you know did those like really naive drawings. So like. You, you, there's two things that like are super important. I would say is like first of all, make it fun. Second of all, have a community to kind of back you up on on whatever you're doing. Yeah, I, I think that it's so important, man. And, it, and we keep going back to the word fun, but like it really is important. Like it's under underestimated so much, and I think uh, that's so much of what is lacking, even from the traditional art world, a lot of times. And I think why so many more artists are having so much fun in this this digital realm. Is because you get to have a little bit more fun that it's not as rigid. It's so new that like, we don't know what is going to be the best or make it work. And uh, the first one of these we did with, with John and he said basically something along the lines of set yourself up to get lucky. Right. And I think that that's such a interesting statement because you think of luck as something random, but put yourself in the position where you can get lucky, AKA work hard, uh, find circles that can help, support you and and your weaknesses you know maybe you're not the best at marketing but maybe someone in this group is and they'll help you out with understanding how to do that right and i think these are all like really great examples of like setting yourself up to receive some luck you know yeah and and just also yeah absolutely i think that like uh it, it, it's calculated luck to a certain extent, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's like, uh, it's, it's uh, analyzing probabilities and seeing what, what works best. Uh, but also, yeah, not, not missing opportunities. Cause the, the thing is like, there's, there's what happens often also is uh, you'll, you'll have opportunities and you won't even know their opportunities. You'll kind of dismiss them really quickly. This has happened so many times to me in the past where I was like, yeah, you know who's this person like approaching me for like doing a show at this like shitty venue or whatever next thing i knew this venue was bumping because it was like <laughs> yeah like i like I, that was a specific moment that was like man like that was a really really thing for me to do you know like where you're just kind of closed off and you have your own like kind of 
perception of how you want your your work to be uh, exhibited. But like, yeah, like uh, don't don't close yourself to anything. Definitely, like, play your luck and and uh, notice when you when you have an opportunity an opportunity. But also, like, I think it's important. Yeah, you do have to work hard, and you you have to you have to kind of push forward even when you're not succeeding. I think John is someone who who uh, who uh, advocates for that a lot because uh, from what I understand, like he there was a long moment where he, he was it was he was not doing well, you know, as an artist and 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 just uh, in general. I think he he was, he was saying uh, in, in one of the videos that I saw that you it posted. That like you know like he was struggling to even like make ends meet and and you know like uh, that happens to, to the best of us. I wouldn't have a, a full time teaching job uh, if if I if I could make ends meet with 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 like my my art. Uh, I could now probably, uh, but yeah, like there's definitely like there's some things that you need to do to be able to kind of you know push through and some people are are really into like one of my friends who's a film director is his whole model is like i'm gonna do this like full time uh, and if i have to live in like uh, a cardboard box i'm gonna live in a cardboard box and i think that's also a, 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 a way to do things but it's also like prioritize your mental health also you know like if you feel yeah. like you're in a, be a better state um producing a bit less and and pushing a bit less and do that you know like it, it, you know don't burn yourself out like and i've been there i've burned myself out i think multiple times uh in and out of nft because of i'm trying to juggle two things at a time but like yeah you know like you like you were saying we keep coming back to fun like if it isn't fun it's not it, it shouldn't like and this goes for any career if you're not if you're not enjoying it like why do it You know, like, a, and I think that's the misconception also with uh, a lot of people who don't do art, who perceive art as just like, yeah, you're just like having fun and like hopefully making money off it. But it's hard work. It's a lot of work. Yeah. It's a lot of hours. And it's a lot of like, you know, I'm not even, we haven't even discussed of like the moments where I would spend like maybe like, six seven hours straight like copying these like these like drawing uh manuals you know to, to learn how to draw in a specific way or to, yep. you know copy my favorite artists or all that stuff you know like um but i i like doing that some people might not like doing that but i, I did so like that's that's why I, i think i like have been able to to get to the level i'm at and also understand as a multidisciplinary artist, like understand the parallels between the different mediums, right? Mm -hmm. I think this is like been such such a value packed conversation here, man. Like hearing hearing these different approaches and hearing how you kind of view these things, I think is is really important, you know. And also the ability to be like, I didn't have it all figured out, you know. Like so many artists who are coming into the space assume that like they're their cohorts who have might have done well had like some master plan. And I think it's really great to remove that mysticism, you know, like some people do, but I would say the majority of us are figuring this stu stuff out in real time with these, this amazing community that is, is being built in real time. You know, it's like, we're just all figuring it out. Yeah. And I think it's, it's part of, um, you said some people do, um, but I don't, believe that <laughs> yeah like, I I, i'm kind of with you there i'm kind of you know, with like, you uh, there you, you see them sometimes you see artists in interviews and you're like wow this person looked like they had it all figured out but i don't think that's the facts the facts are the artists are uh i mean not not, not necessarily in, in their not necessarily all of them in their practice but artists are storytellers to a certain extent or like you know they do try to like What it is to be an artist is essentially trying to, you know, like communicate, uh, you know, a message, right? Like, so if your message is is uh, is uh, straightforward and clear, then 
people you know, are, 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 you know, really all into following whatever you do and following your work. And I think that's something that John succeeds at uh, quite a bit is he's very clear about what his intent, right? Um, but also like, uh, like wh where I'm getting with this is that, you know, if you're an artist and you're, you're trying to promote yourself, you're not going to say the moments where you, you question yourself, right? Like, right. Those those are cool to hear in interviews like this, but like uh, when you're doing kind of like an elevator pitch, you're not going to be like, "Well, I'm questioning myself, and I don't know if this is going to work." <laughs> but like, no, you're not going to say that. You're going to say, well, "This is going to work. This is going to be fine." And if it doesn't work, well, whatever. Absolutely. But you don't say that last part. You just say it's going to work because people want to. Yeah. people want to see confidence. They want to see like, yeah, like this guy's got it. You know. And especially, I think when it comes to the more investment part of art, you know, like they want to know that you know what you're doing. Yep. Agreed. Uh, we're almost at time here and I just want to be mindful of, of your time, you know, 65 hour work weeks. This hour is, is super meaningful to us. I really appreciate you like taking this time uh, out of that crazy schedule. Like really it, it does mean a lot to us and uh, hopefully to all the viewers as well, but what's next for you? You know, where, where are you trying to push yourself creatively? Like I don't, I don't really care about the fiscal aspect at the moment. You know, I'm talking about just, strictly from a creative standpoint like wh where do you see yourself going next um so the, 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 there are there are multiple uh, avenues to that answer but i would say that like right now my main kind of focus is to end the mass warriors collection and uh, because as oh, even though I didn't really think it was going to be a huge thing, it's become a monumental thing. So it's important for me to kind of wrap this up in a nice bow tie. And also just there, there's a bunch of plans for Mass Wars as a brand and as an IP uh, past that. Right now with like kind of just how the market's going, it's, it's a bit on ice, but there's uh, definitely going to be support for the community. We're planning on uh, doing a series of spaces uh going more in depth on like you know the artistic influences of uh some of the mass warriors uh and some of the collectors and mass warriors so we're going to be giving that weekly i think it's going to be on sundays um just as a way to kind of like keep the conversation going artistically uh when it comes to my own art i have a second collection on exchange art which i will be continuing it's called new gen romance and it's uh all a bunch of uh narrative pieces revolving around romanticism in all its forms it can be you know romantic uh kind of lover relationships it can also just be a you know a romantic landscape or a romantic scene or romantic emotion but essentially it's nine pieces. Uh, right now there's three pieces out and I've been meaning to get back to it, but it's been just kind of chaos. So I will be getting back to that. And also we'll be uh, getting back to uh, Amhoz because I kind of put Amhoz on ice when Mass Warriors started. And uh, I've been kind of using, uh, you know, like all the knowledge that I've earned throughout the last few months uh, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to be using that knowledge, I think, to kind of go back to it with a fresh look. Because, uh, like I just said, what, what's, uh, what's amazing about uh, John Lay is that he's clear in his intent when he promotes his work. And I think that Amhoz is a bit too complex in how it was presented. So I'm going to try to strip down a lot of that. And creatively also, just kind of uh, visually, aesthetically, I think that I'm known to make these like kind of grandiose, very complex kind of scenes. Um, but I'm trying to kind of sh like kind of move away from that and, and uh, sh strip strip down a bit like the visual aspect of it and try to make it a bit more kind of clear. Um, for me, like art is always art is kind of a, a question that you ask the viewer. You know, like it's you're basically mm -hmm. challenging the viewer to uh, reflect on their own experiences, to reflect on their what they're seeing in, in, in the work that they're viewing. And I don't want that to be kind of, uh, as, as far as like a narrative, I don't want it to be just given to the viewer. I want them to kind of work for it a bit. Uh, I think that, it's, that those are the most important and the most uh, interesting 
uh, works of art is they, they, they make you sit there and just think for a long time and reflect. Uh, you know, there's some work that just gives you everything in one shot and they're beautiful, but, you know, after that you move on really quickly. Well, it's like, there's some work that you still think about years after and you're still like, wow, like there's something there. So uh, I've been kind of really digging deep and reading a lot on how to accomplish that. And I've been also just, uh, there's a lot of stuff I don't show uh, on Twitter and on, and on Instagram just because I'm, I don't feel the need. And I think that's something that uh, every artist should do is don't feel the need to show everything. You know, there's some things that you can keep to yourself. There's some things that you can write to yourself and you don't need to, to put everything out there, right? So, um, yeah, going back to that uh, collection with uh, kind of like a fresh aesthetic and a fresh look, uh, it's going to be really interesting. That's incredible, man. I'm, I'm really excited to see where you continue to like push yourself artistically, right? And, and like I said and earlier on in the conversation, what gets me excited is this art history aspect where I can like look back and see these certain eras. So not only can we see that within a whole collection, but now we're going to be able to see that in the middle of the collection. You know, it's like he paused this collection and now he's revisiting it after, uh, you know, going through some, some of the things that you ask yourself as an artist in your mind. So it's really cool for us to watch this process and be part of this process with you. And, and just thank you for, for again, taking the time, to to talk about all of this you know this, this is the kind of conversations that hopefully push that next artist along to to think about their artwork a little bit more seriously you know to really conceptualize what exactly they're trying to do right and i, I think you just have uh of course while we're always still figuring it out you have a really great way of, of planting yourself down and being like this is where i want to go you know and and i really appreciate that insight into you know how you get to those those positions you know yeah, I, I mean, we're just kind of all learning as we go, right? And uh, I think that it's important sometimes, and we have that opportunity with NFT to be able to just, since we release work gradually, as opposed to presenting a whole body of work in one shot, I think we have the opportunity sometimes to just kind of stop and be like, I'm going to come back to it. And uh, and and uh, yeah, like you said, it's it's really fun for, I I think it's really fun but it's, I, you know, it may not be the, the general sentiment, but I think it's really fun when someone just stops their collection for a little bit and then comes back to it. Like, um, I'm just going to give a brief example. Like Plaza, uh, who's an, an in, uh, Indonesian artist, he put kind of a, a pause to his collection and then he came back to it like months later and with like some crazy new perspective on it. And I was really like mind blown. And I was like, yeah, this is exactly what I'm looking for to see when you like, realize something about your art and then you're able to kind of yeah. come back to it with a fresh new look. So yeah, I'm glad that you guys are a part of it and I'm really happy that uh, we got to, to have this discussion. Um, hopefully it's not the last one. Definitely not, man. I, uh, I'm really excited to keep doing things like this. And, and when this series ends, eventually a new one will begin. And uh, I, like I said, it's all about figuring out ways where we can add more value uh, for the community overall. And I think that not only do these conversations help uh, the the artist, the creator, but I think it helps the collector too. You know, it shows just like how much thought that when a collector goes through and, and maybe they're not educated on art, they just see the final product. But for the collectors who I really appreciate, they know, you know, they've spent the time to learn what goes into creating these. Uh, maybe not technically, but like in, they know an artist has worked very hard at this. So I really hope that like through these, that more, more people can realize that as well. Uh, and I think the only way to do that is together, right? It's the only way to educate. It's, it's by doing it all together and, and bringing the people in who actually have the, the real like boots on the ground knowledge uh, of what's going on. So again, thank you so much. And, and this, is, this has been a, just an amazing conversation today. Thank you, Goku. This is, a, this is amazing. And yeah, like I, I encourage like anyone who feels the need to, to reach out to me, send me a DM, you know, like I always answer the DMs that uh, have actual conversation, not like <laughs> yes. a potential. Like I, I probably won't answer you if you're, if you tell me if you like try to shill directly your, your, your work. But if you, uh, you know, like if you send me a DM being thoughtful of like, um, 
you know, how you, your approach, uh, I think that I will always answer those DMs. So amazing uh, conversation. Really happy I did this. Sweet. Thank you so much, man.